Uh... Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a second. Sorry about the delay so far. Okay. Where are you? Where are you, Sarah? Sarah? <laughs> Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C., and we are now live. Um, and, and as soon as you're able to share the presentation, uh, whether it's Lillian or Jean-Jacques, um, please go ahead. Okay, so welcome everyone to today's webinar, um, where we're going to be discussing networking urban MPAs to face their diverse and unique challenges. And we're very pleased today to welcome Jean-Jacques Goussard and Lillian Wetzel of the MPA Resilience Partnership. Mike DeLuca of the Jean Jacques Cousteau National Estuarine Research Reserve, Mathieu Ducroc of the Regional Network of MPAs in West Africa, and Jacqueline Gauthier de, Bar de Bernardi, sorry, Jacqueline, uh, Director of MPAs in Monaco. Um, we're very pleased everyone could be here with us today. Um, I wanted to let you know that we'll have presentation first and we'll probably have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Uh, but regardless, if you send in questions either through the question panel or through the chat, um, the, the speakers will be able to see the questions. And if we can't get them to, the, to them today, they'll be able to answer them offline as well. So feel free to send in questions and com comments at any point. Um, you can use both the question panel and the chat um, with the chat, you have the option to send information to everyone on at the, on the webinar. Um, we just ask that you be professional with this. Feel free to share relevant information um, about urban MPAs and the topic um, with all of the attendees. Just um, keep it professional and on topic. Okay, thank you everyone. And I'll turn it over to our presenters now. Jean-Jacques, are you starting? Yeah. Yes, but I'm trying to put it in, uh, in full screen and, uh, and it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, now, maybe. Okay? Yes, that looks great. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for taking time. Maybe um, all the speakers can introduce, uh, you can introduce yourself. Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. I'm Lilian Wetzel. I'm, I'm Brazilian. I'm actually based in Brazil just now. And uh, I have been working in the Resilience Partnership for the past three years with Jean-Jacques and the rest of the team. And I'm really happy to have you all here today. Thank you. Jacqueline? Okay, je suis. Um... I'm Jacqueline, hello, I'm Jacqueline Gauthier de Bernardi. I'm the manager of MPAs from Monaco. Um, these um, MPAs are managed um, with an association and the government. Mike? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike DeLuca. I work at uh, Rutgers University, and I'm one of my responsibilities is managing a national estuarine research reserve, the Cousteau Reserve, in New Jersey. And it's part of a uh, 30 site uh, network uh, in the uh, the US. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, talking to you from Senegal. I am Mathieu Ducrot. I am the chairperson of the scientific board of the West African Marine Protected Areas Network. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm talking from France. My name is uh, Jean-Jacques Goussard, and I'm coordinating the Resilience Partnership uh, since 2016. And thank you very much for making time to, to attend this webinar. Okay, so we will start. Uh, we will talk uh, in this webinar of a new initiative about a new initiative uh, on urban MPAs. Uh, we started uh, developing this resilience partnership, as I said, uh, since 2016, 2017, with different objectives and mainly uh, to work with uh, MPA manager in order to improve the capacity of the MPAs to cope with rapid change. And uh, we have been working especially on strategies implemented by MPAs to cope with rapidly changing environments, but also 
the approaches developed by MPAs to contribute to the resilience of surrounding uh, coastal areas. Our objective was to improve MPA resilience oriented management. So uh, considering that uh, with uh, the acceleration of change, management of MPAs must be adapted. Uh, and we have been starting building on good practice in order to provide service services to MPA managers through uh, adequate tools and toolkit, such as the resilience self-assessment tool uh, that have been used now until now in 116 MPAs in 22 countries, uh, helping to take into account key factors that are generally not considered in management in existing management effectiveness frameworks such as capacity of anticipation or capacity of or to provide and to develop lessons learned and other other uh, criteria, other factors. And the third point was to contribute to the improvement of MPA management, providing guidance to reinforce resilience capacity and especially at the level of uh, MPA management plans. So, our approach was first to provide service and tools to MPA managers to strengthen resilience-based management. Uh, we have been focusing on face-to-face -face capacity building exercise, uh, working on innovation and science to policy, and working building on uh, partners' good practices. Since 2017, we have been engaging uh, MPA managers through many events uh, and workshops, webinars, personal contact. We have a web platform uh, in two years or three years. We got 43,000 users. Uh, we have been participating to many international and uh, international and regional events. We have been working with networks, MPA networks, such as MedPAN, NAMPAN, French Biodiversity Agency, Brazilian uh, Biodiversity Agency, and other, and uh, providing and disseminating uh, the current communication product. At the end of uh, 2023, uh, the toolkit, the Resilient Self-Assessment Tool, as I said, has been in use in uh, 116 MPAs in 22 countries with some MPAs that have been using this uh, tool two or three times, repeating the assessment uh, yearly. You, you can see here uh, a rapid mapping of the MPA we have been working with. Uh, we have been working mainly in uh, South America, in Southern South America, in Western Africa, with 23 MPAs in Central Africa, Southern Africa, Southwest Indian Ocean, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, in Northern America, and in Central America. Uh, we were at the point to start working with the Coral Triangle Initiative in Southeast Asia, but uh, uh, the project finished, and uh, maybe we will work in this region uh, in the coming uh, years or months. Uh, we have been developing a resilience uh, web platform, uh, which gives access to the tool and to the toolkit. Uh, this web platform is uh, currently in uh, upgrade. We are currently upgrading it, and uh, the new version uh, will be uh, released, we think, by the more or less the month of April or May. Uh, and this new version is uh, has been developed by for the Resilience Partnership Institute recently created. Uh, we started working in Western Africa during the COVID period in 2021. You see that everybody is uh, wearing masks in the COVID period. And it was very interesting because there were the first test of the tool with uh, especially working with the local government, not only uh, the managers of MPA, but also local government and stakeholders. And it was really very, very interesting. It was in Senegal, and we have been working with more than 15 uh, MPAs in this country. And since then, uh, we have been developing training of trainers. Uh, and now we have 
more or less 220 MPA managers who have been trained in 27 countries and who are able to replicate uh, this training. Another important point was uh, the adoption uh, during the IUCN World Conservation Congress in 2020 in Marseille, the adoption of the resolution Reso 030 on coastal resilience. And this resolution, uh, global resolution, is the first resolution on coastal resilience since uh, the history of the different uh, World Conservation Congress. Uh, after the adoption of this resolution, uh, this, uh, this resolution led to the establishment of the World Coast Coastal Forum, WCF, and the first forum was in September, was, has been held in September 2023 in China, and the Resilience Partnership Institute is involved into the monitoring of this resolution. Well, we have some interesting uh, lessons learned after this uh, dissemination and uh, promotion of AirSAP, of the Resilience Self-Assessment Tool, but we will not enter here in details regarding this, uh, these lessons learned. And we will go directly to uh, our topic on urban MPA. I just would like to mention that uh, the tool, the Resilience Self-Assessment Tool, is now uh, we are working to combine it with the EU IMED tool, Integrated Management Effectiveness Tool. We are working together. Uh, ERSAT has been adopted by three national MP umbrella institutions and integrated in four new projects in Africa. So we are continuing uh, the work with ERSAT. Uh, we have some uh, training. Planning, planning in Northern Africa, maybe in uh, the Pacific, in CEMAR, with the CEMAR network, and uh, maybe with the CARSPO. And uh, the demand for this tool is growing. So we are trying to attend this demand, providing the tool freely on the website. Now, after the experience working with uh, in so many countries and in with so many MPAs, we really have been realizing that the thematic and the problematic of urban MPA is really uh, is really to be developed and to be addressed. So we have been shaping a new initiative to develop this initiative and stressing the links between MPAs and local governments. Because many times MPAs are managed by central institution, national institution, or in federal country by federal institution. And finally, the links between the functional link between the MPA manager and MPA management and local government is many times very weak. And we think that it's really necessary, uh, talking about resilience, to strengthen and to reinforce this link. So I will present rapidly the urban MPA initiative and uh, we will have some uh, case study or showcase developed by uh, by uh, Lilian, Mike, uh, Jacqueline and uh, and Mathieu. So why urban MPAs? It's important to note that there is a very strong link that can be established in urban protected areas between the natural and cultural dimension of conservation. Urban MPAs are linked to many players in the urban system, including government decision makers, makers the media, opinion leaders, and players in the educational and cultural networks. Also, technical departments of urban communities and port services. So their management is complex and depends on the quality of the partnership established with these different categories of actors, urban, te urban technical service, port authority, tourism operators, for example. And these actors are often quite distant from nature conservation. In this sense, this management can be considered as de facto shared. It's shared management illustrating and thus helping to promote best practice. They are directly treated by urban sprawl and densification. And we can really consider that a high proportion 
of two days non-urban marine protected area can be expected to become urban in the next two, 10 or 20 years, especially in emerging countries such as Africa, in emerging continents such as Africa, South America, and Asia. The second point is a social dimension of uh, urban MPAs. While the issue of urban marine protected MP area is surprisingly little documented in the scientific literature, their importance and social utility are undeniable. undeniable. They welcome a large number of visitors, many of whom visit frequently, even daily, uh, sometimes without even realizing that they are visiting a protected area. Many of these urban visitors have a very limited experience of nature and their use tends to be much more social, socially diverse than of protected areas further from town. So they contribute directly to the quality of life and social mix of the urban population who come from more or less privileged neighborhoods and live there. The urban MPAs also are catalysts for innovation. They are subject to the urban side effects such as air and water pollution, but they are also at the front line when it comes to the introduction of invasive exotic species, especially near port facilities. They can play a sentinel role in monitoring water quality and in the early detection of the presence of invasive species and pathologies that can affect certain endangered natural species. Now, the diversity and complexity of the pressure they are subject to, combined with a strong level of artificialization and the effect of climate change makes them particular, particularly uh, uh, relevant fields in which to reflect on issues of biology, ecological and institutional resilience, but also in relation with the value of the service rendered by MPAs to local communities. So they offer a suitable terrain for full-scale experimentation or demonstration of innovative nature-based solution for coastal defense and protection. We will uh, see that in New Jersey it is the case through hybrid coastal defense device. That means combination of NBS, nature-based solution, and non-reversible hard solutions. Further, further developments can be envisaged with a view to exploring the value of developing peri-urban aquaculture facilities which can both play a sentinel role with regard to water quality and develop regenerative aquaculture models contributing to ecosystem restoration. Finally, your men, your men MPAs help us to face the future. They foreshadow situation of rapid change that will tend to multiply in the coming years uh, with the influence of the coastalization of the world's population and urban expansion against a backdrop of increasing effects of climate change. As such, we can consider that there are laboratories for experiment experimenting with solutions that will need to be replicated in other geographies. Urban marine protected area can therefore be seen and pilot laboratories for marine and coastal resilience and conservation as much for their social, cultural, and ecological usefulness as for the massive and diverse pressures they face. While the notion of sustainable coastal cities is beginning to emerge, the question of marine protected area located in this urban context has so far remained very much on the sidelines of the general movement into marine and coastal conservation. Very few papers, very few publications regarding uh, coast marine, uh, uh, marine and coastal protected areas, while uh, terrestrial protected areas, urban terrestrial protected areas, there is a lot of uh, literature. Working with urban MPAs is also a way to strengthen relations between conservation efforts and institutions and local governments. Now I will uh, give the floor to, uh, to Jacqueline from Monaco for some uh, words. 
Hello, so I, I will do a short uh, presentation with only one slide, excuse me. Uh, so I will explain, uh, you, when you see the principality of Monaco on the, on the slide, uh, you can see that it's a very, very urbanized environment. So the first question is, why did you do you, do we have MPAs in Monaco? So the origin is be, be, because in the 17th, the Prince René III wanted to preserve the coastal line. So the first thing that we we made, he, he wanted to um, he asked two volunteers uh, to create the first MPA of La Voto, that's the biggest one on your left. And this MPA was created to preserve the Posidonia uh, seagrass in uh, in Monaco. And it was in 76. And in uh, 86, a second one, the one of Speduc, just after at the outside of the harbor, was created for the coaligenus um, that he wanted to preserve. So we have two small MPAs. Uh, the first one is 33 hectares and the second one two hectares. So we can say that's like anywhere else. And uh, we have um, reglementation, um, uh, no no navigation, no mooring, no fishing. And the most, imp we are, I, I may say that there are two most important things. Um, the first is the high level of protection because there are, uh, everyone can see the MPAs when we're on the, on, in the town. So the surveillance is very important because it avoids to have um, problems in the MPA. And the other point is that these are really um, laboratories in a natural environment because we work with uh, a lot of research institutes. And so we may uh, see the effects of the MPAs. And in the, to work with these MPAs, we have a management plan it's very important because it's um, a co-management with um, IMPN, the association, my association, and uh, the government. And we have, um, uh, I may say, the local uh, actors and uh, stakeholders are very involved in the MPA. And all the population um, knows the MPAs and wants to, to try to, to help to protect them. We have a lot of volunteers who help us. Uh, when we have um, something to do, uh, anything, and um, we, what do we do? Uh, we we have a lot of um, environmental monitoring about fishes or Posidonia seagrass. Uh, we have also monitoring of uh, human activities, and uh, these uh, MPAs are really uh, education tools. So, but that's easy because that's really small. And we have a lot of um, possibilities to, to speak about what we are doing. And they are very much approved by the population. So that's perhaps a, a case different from the others. The other one, I don't know uh, how they, they are managed outside of Monaco. So what I may say is that they are really efficient. We have searchers that uh, do the... For example, visual census about fish populations, and the result is really clear. We are more fishes inside the limits of the MPA than outside. So I think that even if you have MPAs in a urban area, even if they are small, the most important is to have MPAs along the coastal line. Is it okay for you? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. I, I would like to, to highlight the fact that uh, Monaco is a perfect example of all the challenge facing by, uh, faced by urban MPAs, but also all the opportunities to link and to, and to connect uh, research, monitoring, experimentation uh, for the management of the MPA with civil society, urban and city technical service, education, heritage. It's really interesting because this, uh, this space of Monaco is uh, a mature, very mature urban space. And uh, really uh, the management of MPA in this condition is a real, probably a real benefit for all the city of Monaco and all the habitants. Thank you very much, Jacqueline.
Now, and thank you for us. And also, uh, now we will uh, we will uh, talk about some experience in Senegal. Uh, it's a totally different context, but we can foresee uh, taking into account the velocity of the urban sprawl in uh, in Western Africa. Uh, in some place in Senegal, uh, situation uh, maybe not as Monaco, but like Monaco can happen in the in the next decade. Mathieu, please. He mentioned he had a very, very unstable um, connection just now, uh, Jean-Jacques, that maybe it would not be possible to present. Uh -huh. I don't know okay. if he's there. Okay. So uh, we will have two examples of uh, community-based MPAs. Is a community-based model for MPAs is uh, a model which has been created in Senegal. Uh, it is uh, uh, the integration of the of the. Well, these MPAs are created on the initiative of the population, uh, of the fishers, and uh, of the communities. And the state, the government, will relay this initiative, uh, supporting and uh, and uh, supporting the community for the management of MPA. So they say that it is the alliance of the legality of the government on, of the state and the legitimacy of the stakeholders of the local stakeholders. So we have one case: is a salmon community-based marine protected area. This uh, reserve with more than 100 hectares of mangrove have been integrated integrally uh, restored by the community. Uh, there are very high and strong pressure linked to bad land management, corruption, and rapid urban and touristic development with uh, speculation on the lands. The conservation status was modified in 2020 to freeze the land use and strengthen the management rules because the urban sprawl was too fast. Today, this uh, small community marine protected area receives more than 40,000 visitors by year, and uh, it creates more than 400 formal and informal jobs. So the main challenge now is to stress consideration of MPA as a key, as a key sustainable development tool for the municipal and departmental local development plans. In Gandul, community-based MPA, uh, this MPA is isolated from the middle of the Cine Salum, which is a very wide reserve uh, of biosphere and world heritage, heritage site until 2022. But recently, they have been building uh, a big bridge replacing the ferry and with an enlargement of the main road and the construction of a big port in the seat of Fondium. So now, uh, if we talk about uh, rapid change, we are really in a specific case. The main challenge is to get prepared to face uh, a very fast rising urban development, touristic and industrial pressure. And the resilient self assessment tool has been a key tool to uh, detect uh, very clearly this change and to involve local government into the preparation works and strategy in order to cope with this strong modification on the local environment. Alors, the next. The next is the Gore Island Community Based MPA. Gore is an island just front of uh, the capital city of Dakar and just front of the Dakar port. Uh, Gore and Dakar were historically the West African's main colonial port and were a major trading center, including the slave trade until uh, 1850. Uh, there is a deep water port and um, an ancient volcano has been shaping the coastline. Uh, it is a very rare rocky coastline with submarine canyons and proximity direct to oceanic environment with a remarkable biodiversity. It is the most visited historical site in Western Africa 
and it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, the MPA under shared governance has been established by presidential decree in 2020, including this MPA includes the port of Dakar in its delimitation and management committee. That means that the authority of the ports are participating to the uh, management committee. What is the main challenge is to involve the urban port and industrial stakeholders in a concerted approach for conserving and valorizing the natural and cultural value and their unique values of the site, of the city. Now I will give the floor to, to Mike. To Jean -Jean. <laughs> so I wanted to, I want to speak from the uh, perspective of um, New Jersey. <laughs> And the Cousteau Reserve, which I mentioned earlier, is part of a, a national network of 30 sites, soon to be 32 across the, uh, the US. And by no means is the Cousteau Reserve a, in an urban uh, area. Uh, and in fact, it's about 115,000 acres in size or um, about um, 50,000 uh, hectares. And it's buffered by a national bio biosphere reserve, which is about a million acres. So that really, um, uh, supports the um, uh, critical habitat and uh, rel relatively undisturbed ecosystem. However, New Jersey is the most densely populated state uh, in the U.S. And so we really have an opportunity to take some of the uh, management practices, uh, lessons learned, uh, and uh, the products from the um, uh, earlier uh, resilience uh, program that John Jock uh, described and adapt that to urban situations. And if you look at New Jersey, it's really a gradient of human disturbance from north to south. North, Northern New Jersey is very highly uh, developed um, inland as well as uh, along the coast. Uh, there are a lot of uh, seawalls, much armoring, seawalls, bulkheads, uh, these have um, very strong impacts on um, on the environment, and in fact, uh, you know these hard structures tend to reduce biodiversity. Um, uh, we lose ecosystem services and critical habitat uh, as as well. Recently, uh, the federal government and our state government have been investing and emphasizing nature-based strategies. Um, to address um, uh, some of the impacts uh, from not just urbanization but climate change as well, even our, one of the one of our federal agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers, which traditionally has invested and supported hard structures armoring along our coast, has been uh, focusing on nature-based uh, strategies to restore critical habitat and protect uh, infrastructure um, along our, our our coastline. Back in 2012, we had a hurricane or superstorm uh, hit uh, the New Jersey coast uh, that was sandy. Uh, we had a lot of lessons learned and best management practices um, that were identified following that uh, storm to help enhance the resilience of our coastal communities and MPAs uh, along the, the coastline. And in particular, some really innovative uh, design strategies that were uh, identified. Um, resilient design of structures, for example, um, incorporating breakout panels that uh, could uh, lessen the impact of uh, storm surge, you know, on on uh, structures. Um, regional approaches to resilience, particularly for those MPAs that are in close proximity uh, to to one another, uh, can also be uh, another strategy. One is only uh, as resilient as one's uh, neighbor, uh, reciting critical infrastructure visitor uh, facilities uh, uh, for MPAs to reduce impacts. And of course, taking into account some of the um, social and cultural issues that John Jock uh, spoke about and uh, ensuring that um, strategies you know, address some of those social issues that we have uh, in highly urbanized uh, areas. Uh, I think one of the values of the, the program uh, to date is the fact that we have established uh, 
these web-based tools, um, a collaborative uh, network where we can share very easily lessons learned and best management practices. And I think at least for us here in New Jersey, uh, we can certainly benefit from uh, some of the um, uh, efforts that are underway now in Monaco that Jacqueline described and those in uh, Senegal that uh, Jean-Jacques and Mathieu um, uh, spoke about. Uh, so there's a lot of value in uh, partnering and, uh, and networking. And I certainly look forward to um, bringing what we can to the table, but also learning from uh, others as we move forward into this uh, urban uh, initiative uh, that uh, hopefully you know, can address some of the, uh, um, the issues related, not just to population, but uh, climate change uh, on our uh, developed cities and developed coastlines. So I look forward to that and I'll stop right there and turn it back to Jean-Jacques. Hi, uh, excuse me, Mike. Uh, hi, everyone. Jean-Jacques has just had a major uh, problem. Uh, he has, he's had a power cut uh, in Brittany in spite of Britain's resilience. Uh, they are undergoing a very strong storm just now. So I I will try to, to bring the presentation, the slides on, and uh, we'll take on from there until he can come back. Uh, just one second. A good example of resilience, Lilian. Yes. Adaptation. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, just one sec. Um, I just, let's see. Let's try to do it just now. Let's see. Okay. Can you see the screen just now? Perfect. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Let me just minimize it. So that's where we were in Senegal and Mike. Okay. Fine. Let's just see if sent another message, but now it's I Ileon, can one I of my slides. <laughs> Ileon, can I just uh, interrupt? For yeah, a sorry. I yeah, forgot you... to address one, uh, one point that is with aquaculture. Um, you know, this is a, um, a strategy that can be used to enhance habitat, uh, improve water quality, provide structure for other organisms. And um, it's challenging to, um, uh, particularly for shellfish aquaculture, to um, enlist it as a strategy in uh, urban areas where typically uh, the waters are closed to uh, shellfish uh, aquaculture. However, there are some species like rig mussels, you know, that can be used, which are not used for human consumption that can provide or restore some of the ecosystem services. And in fact, uh, New York City is investing in a project downstream of a new wastewater treatment plant to employ uh, rib mussels as a, a further or additional biofilter. So I just wanted to uh, add that point to, to my comments. Thank you. Excellent, Mike. Thanks a lot. Okay, so we'll go on to the next example. Just a sec. Jean-Jacques has just got his power back, but no internet. So we'll follow from here. Right, so um, what I would like to introduce you to just now is um, a very good and recent example that we have in the south of Brazil of um, an urban MPA that has just been created this month. So it's in its very early days and uh, full of challenges, but in spite of having no experience as an MPA whatsoever, it uh, has a long, um, long experience as an issue. Uh, because it's um, the result of a process of coastal dune conservation and restoration initiated and led by a local NGO 30 years ago. So uh, it's a very mature issue, but still has a lot of things to, to be settled. So this has been uh, created um, having uh, the conservation goals in mind, because that's a requirement from our uh, Brazilian system that we have um, uh, conservation as the main scope when we create a um, uh, protected area. So we have endemic species, uh, we have uh, other uh, native um, uh, endangered species, and we have migratory birds, other birds that use the dunes for reproduction, for to, to lay their eggs. So it's a very important um, environment from the, the, the point of view of conservation, in spite of looking very monotonous, uh, it's quite rich. Um, in spite of that, uh, we do have a very intense use 
And uh, in this site, that's also very it's very important site from the heritage point of view. Uh, we have in this area, it's a very interesting example for the urban MPA approach because it's located in an estuary, one of the most important estuaries of Brazil. We are in the very south of Brazil, just near the, the border with Uruguay. So we have an estuary where we have a lot of exchange with the ocean naturally. It's a very rich, uh, bio biologically rich area uh, and also subject to a very intense sport activity just there. It's actually by the just next to the first, what is the first, was the first bathing resort that was created in the early 1900s in this state of Brazil. So it's a, it has a lot of cultural historical heritage. The the this municipality is the oldest one in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. It's 287 years old. So it has a lot a lot of uh, other attributes in addition to the biological ones. Uh, in regarding the uses, it's also interesting because, of course, we have a very large extensive dune system that acts uh, as a natural uh, defense, coastal defense structure, and it has it gains even more importance in terms of climate change. In spite of being uh, an area that's not subject to erosion, it's subject to accretion. Uh, but even though we have a lot of storm sur uh, storm surges that uh, do bring a lot of water. Uh, into the um, into the urban areas, so they do provide a lot of services. We have here on the left some of the uh, some of the examples of uses, intense uses. We have the the urban area that started as a bathing resort. Now it's a natural, a normal uh, residential area. We have a very intense traffic uh, on the beach during summer. Uh, it's not completely legal, but uh, it's accepted somehow, and it's been incorporated in the culture of this place. This is just by uh, the area that has just been created. The area doesn't take the the the, um, the beach itself, but uh, the dunes. So it's just border of this area. Uh, we have the entrance to the estuary just next to this area. You see in the major photo here, we have uh, where the, the name of the park is written and the date of creation, that's where uh, the ships enter into the port area and the estuary. So um, it's very intense. The, the, this protected area is, is this green area, taking the dunes and the marshes behind. So um, it's, it's a, not too big, it's 440 hectares, but uh, it's sort of um, a buffer between the, the, the natural environment and the... Um, and the urban uh, pressure, both from the residential area and from uh, the surroundings of the port here on the, the right uh, hand corner. Um, as I said, it has a lot of, it can provide a lot of good services that have a lot to do with uh, this new concept of urban MPAs. We can see that um, there are good opportunities for more sustainable tourism, ecotourism uh, uh, opportunities that can bring a lot of revenue also to the, to the municipality. Uh, as I said, coastal protection. And what's really important is that uh, it has been uh, just created uh, among um, a lot of debate. It has undergone a lot of debate uh, with the community. It has involved many different actors and institutions in this creation, uh, the local executive, the port authority, NGOs, university. So all these people who can now take a lead uh, on the um, on the management of this MPA and can bring a lot of inputs and exchanges uh, during man the management process have been involved from the beginning. And what's also important is that, as you can see in the little map uh, down there, that's not exactly a location map, but it identifies that other uh, MPAs are located nearby. So uh, it an urban MPA that has a lot of potential to engage um, with other surrounding MPAs of different categories. Some are not urban, some are urban. So um, a big mosaic that can be created, uh, intensified. It's already been in place, but uh, it can also grow from now onwards with this officially created MPA. So um, it's just a new example that fits well into the concept and uh, that we wish uh, great success in the management and hope to have 
uh, them to experiment our RSAT uh, tool in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liliana. I'm back uh, because uh, we have a very strong storm with wind at uh, 120, 130 kilometers by hours, and uh, there were a power failure <laughs> during uh, five minutes. Okay, I'm back. Uh, you didn't have a certain Cascais? Excuse me, Jean-Jacques, just excuse, excuse me. Uh, do you want me to proceed with the slides I have, or are you bringing yes. uh, your uh, you, Because mine is not exactly the... That you can uh, I think that you can proceed with the slides you have, because uh, the old slides were before. Okay. Yeah, no. okay. Okay. So, uh, you 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 have been talking about Kashkais or not no? Yet? I have just finished Brazil. Okay. Kashkais is a, a, a very emblematic uh, example of uh, of the urban marine protected area. It is in uh, Portugal. It's uh, a very historic and heritage town located at the mouth of the Taj River, 30 kilometers from the capital city. Uh, this MPA has been created in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, it was just a municipal initiative. It is the only locally managed marine area in all Portugal. And they are working very closely with the EICNF, national institution uh, leading and managing marine protected areas. But this marine protected area is directly managed by the municipality. And it's very interesting because they have been a lot of, uh, they have been very successful in engaging the population, engaging the university uh, with a very strong educative. Uh, educative uh, component, and uh, it was uh, in December uh, because they call us for training on uh, ERSAT, on the Resilient Self-Assessment Tool, and the result of the assessment we have been uh, doing together there was very positive. That means that the, the resilience profile of this municipal MPA is very, very interesting. And we hope uh, that uh, when the initiative on the urban MPA will be launched, that take uh, uh, an important role in this initiative, like Monaco or other emblematic uh, cities. Next. Okay. Okay. So the objective of the initiative, uh, uh, the initiative, the objective, uh, we have two key objectives. The first is typical urban MPA case studies in order to extract lessons learned and to develop tools and guidelines to propose to managers of urban MPAs. The second is to establish a network of urban MPAs to share experience and promote mutual learning of existing pathway to solve common and shared challenge. Uh, that means that it is more or less the same approach with the resilience partnership at the beginning, uh, when the problematic was uh, to increase the resilience of marine protected area. Uh, these objectives are encompassing the following elements. First, to showcase urban MPAs to identify common issues and challenge dealing with pressure service delivery to the host cities. There, it's very important for us to identify practice of managers and to disseminate this good practice between the managers in order to improve the management of urban MPAs. The networking approach uh, for MPAs Located in high urban or touristic pressure, it's important also to facilitate twinnings between the MPAs, companionship, and mutual learning of resilience oriented solutions. Also, to capitalize on experience in a way to develop a dedicated practical toolkit to strengthen the governance and management effectiveness of urban MPAs and to communicate internationally on the prospective dimension of the approach 
and the utility of the toolkit, the cost origination of, soci of the societies will lead many MPAs to face increasing typical urban pressure. As we said, many MPAs today that are not today urban MPAs will become to MPAs in the coming decade. And to prepare a dedicated event in the Gore Island MPA, the first West African urban MPA during Impact 6. It's important to mention that Impact 6 will be held and hosted by Senegal, and uh, the urban MPA can take uh, an important place into this uh, during this uh, international event. For us, it looks it looks like it appears very important to provide visibility for partner cities contributing to the initiative and promote internationally this innovative direction and work in relation with sustainable cities initiative. I've been in touch with the team of CTs. It is an initiative led by the Ocean and Climate French platform. And uh, we will continue the in order to work to, to try to work together. Finally, it's important to reinforce the link between conservation efforts and institution and local governments. Uh, as I said before, uh, the management of MPAs depend more on central institutions, especially dedicated to conservation, but the links between local government and uh, managers of MPA, sometimes it works very well. Many times there are very few contacts and the link is very weak, while uh, the quality of the local government is very important in order to ensure the resilience and the continuity and the sustainability of, uh, of MPA. Next. Okay. 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 So I'll just um, have a quick word about the this slide here, um, and talk about the twinning process. So how we expect to engage people to become new partners of this new idea. So in spite of being a, a new idea, it, uh, it builds on previous projects and on previous experiences in the formation of partnerships, and uh, which proved to be very successful. Um, for example, we have started in 2017 uh, with a previous project on transatlantic MPA networking. And um, the first five people uh, some of them are here today, uh, got together to discuss a new idea about resilience. And from there onwards, we progressed to reach over 300 um, uh, partners, uh, interested people, um, participants of our activities uh, in 2023. So it's a long way that has been um, walked and we want to keep walking now based on this experience. Uh, and uh, get new partners for the new idea. It's um, it's a quite uh, open uh, process at the moment. We're still uh, formatting uh, the idea, but uh, we'll certain, certainly use um, the contacts and the, um, the participation of people that have been involved so far. So uh, we have members, historic partners from our resilience partnership uh, during the Ocean Governance Project. We have a long, a large community of RSET users. You can see on the map on top that we have um, already got 116 assessments uh, from 21 countries. That's the latest number I have here, but. Uh, it changes um, all the time, so it could be more now. Uh, we have also been working and developing uh, contacts with many different uh, MPA manager networks at regional level. For example, the Rampao in Western Africa, we have Medban in uh, the Mediterranean, other national networks, thematic um, uh, networks, national MPA agencies in some countries like Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, we have the the national agencies that are quite articulated, and also many, many people that have been attending our webinars um, and other activities. So we have a wide public 
we have reached the wide public so far, and we'll be building this road uh, along the way, uh, step stone by step stone, as you see down there. Uh, it's a constructive approach that will be developed along the way. So it's very much lessons learned, but open to, to new contributions. I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Lydia. When we start with the Resilience Partnership in 2017, we met together in New Jersey. We were five persons, one coming from Brazil, one coming from the US, one coming from Africa. Uh, I was coming from France. And uh, it was a new story. And uh, there were a, a blank page. Uh, and few by few, we have been able to, to build all this network of uh, contacts of managers of MPA managers so we are very uh, we we start this initiative of uh, on urban MPAs with a lot of uh, humility but also we know that uh, it has been possible and it will be possible to uh, to grow up and to continue and to and to go ahead uh, on this initiative next please So what are the next steps? Um, first, we we have uh, to finalize and disseminate uh, widely the concept document, which is already available in draft. Uh, if some participants are interested, please uh, send a message to uh, to Sarah or to Lilian. I didn't. Put, I I will put the the mail. I forgot to put the mail in the chat. Uh, you can maybe put your mail in the in the chat. Uh, second, uh, we will shape an inception phase based on a scoping study for launching the initiative. We are in the way to identify pilot partners. We have a lot of uh, candidate cities, uh, especially uh, in Mexico, in Brazil, maybe in Colombia, in Africa, in Western Africa. We have a lot also in uh, in Europe and in the Mediterranean uh, and in uh, in uh, the US so we have to uh, to develop this scoping study to understand really what will be the criteria uh, to select some uh, pilot partners and we will try to always to twin MPAs and city and local government and to work with both MPAs and local government they are very interesting. After that, we will have to confirm the support and commitment from pilot partners. It could be, as I say, urban MPAs, cities, national institutions. In the case of Senegal, it is a national umbrella institution in charge of uh, MPAs, which will be the partner, regional MPA networks and projects. And after that, we will launch uh, officially uh, the initiative with uh, maybe with a kickoff workshop uh, when all the condition will be uh, will be okay. Next. So we would like to to thank you very much and to please apologies for the power failure. Uh, I live in Brittany. Uh, my house is uh, more or less 100 meters from the uh, port. Uh, Brittany is, uh, we are uh, very close to the sea and the Northern Atlantic uh, this year is really, really very uh, agitated. Very, <laughs> so it, sometimes it's a little bit difficult with storms. But we are resilient and we cope with this bad weather. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your feedbacks and your contribution. We were very proud to to be able to to live with you and to receive all your advice, contribution, uh, and feedbacks in order to improve uh, this uh, concept. Thank you very much. Maybe Hi. you have um, uh, one word to Jacqueline, Mike. J'ai pas compris. Euh, Peut-être vous avez un petit mot à, à dire, euh, Jacqueline ou Mike. 
Yeah, I just yep. like to say that you know we're, we look forward to uh, continuing a conversation with the group online today. And if you do have some suggestions or recommendations for us as we proceed to the scoping phase study, please you know do uh, send your comments to us. I see that there were a few questions and comments already in the chat, we'll do our best to to address those. Thank you. Okay, Mike, your audio was not so good. Maybe you have a storm also in New Jersey. <laughs> okay, yeah. Did you, you, you didn't hear me? No, we got it. Jacqueline? Oh, no, only- it? Okay, uh, thank you. I appreciate it to be on the, uh, webinar because it was very interesting. I know that we have particularities here in Monaco, but I see that we're more or less we have all the same problem problems with MPAs and uh, uh, all we have the same vol volunteer volunteer to um, to work about MPAs even in a urban environment. So it's very very interesting, and I feel less alone. Thank you very much. I would like also uh, to thank uh, Sarah. Otto has been uh, accompanying, uh, working with us uh, for more than one year. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah and John, uh, for your help and support. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you all for presenting today, Jean-Jacques, Lillian, Mike, Mathieu, and Jacqueline. We're very glad to have you today and that we were able to get everything going and present. And we thank everyone who was able to attend. I think some people have had to leave. Um, but uh, well, there were a few questions, but we'll go ahead and I'll send those to um, the presenters after the webinar and they can respond offline. So we'll go ahead and wrap up, but thank you again. And we look forward to seeing this initiative as it progresses in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye, thank everyone. You. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Do join our community. <laughs>